Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Peter Marty, Senior Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. Commercial fishing in first century Palestine was a line of work that we can only imagine. Wooden boats on the Sea of Galilee, nothing fancy about them, fish guts probably on the floor, a mess of tangled nets in the bow, no life jackets to speak of, men, presumably those are the ones who fished, hanging out by day and by night, some fishing we know from the Bible definitely happened at night. It couldn't have been a particularly easy life. We know that some of the Jerusalem fish shops did quite well financially. But the fishermen themselves, well, they had to pay fees and taxes in all kinds of degrees to Herod Antipas, the tetrarch of the Galilean region. So imagine that first century life of fishing. As you'll hear in just a moment, the story of Jesus calling some very men there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He walks along one day down that shore and invites four different men to entertain a completely different life than one that involved fishing nets. And for reasons we'll never quite be able to understand, they said yes. They said yes to Jesus. So I'm going to read that particular story now and then reflect on it in a special way. Here it is in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. It's just a few verses. I'm going to start at the 14th verse 
and read through the 20th verse. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Now, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately these two left their nets, and they followed Jesus. As he went on a little farther, Jesus saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed Jesus. That's Mark, the first chapter. Well, I'm going to come back to these fishermen in a few minutes, but what I want to do is come to them by way of a discussion about friendship and relationship and how we make ourselves available to these things. And then we might be able to see what Jesus was hoping for when he said to those fishermen on that particular day, come and follow me and I will make you fish for people. Well, if I may, for a few minutes, I want to think with you about uh, relationships, specifically relationships outside of family, and I'd like to do it in this uh, particular way. It seems to me that we now live in a world where we don't appear to need each other for very much anymore. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but we, we don't act as if we need neighbors. We're pretty self-sufficient people. And when you come right down to it, you can probably survive, and I can probably do just fine physically without my neighbors. Most of you have enough income to get by, to have the basic necessities of life, or maybe a whole lot more. Most of you have enough amenities in your life as well. If you don't have snow service and you own a home, you probably own a snow shovel or a snow blower, and you probably don't need your neighbors. Most of you have enough internet know-how that, honestly, in this day and age, if you had a mirror and you had got a YouTube video and you found a scalpel, you could probably give yourself an appendectomy. You don't need other people. Artificial intelligence, it's everywhere. A report yesterday, 90% of American companies have artificial intelligence somewhere in their operation. So who needs a neighbor when you got all this stuff? We don't need our neighbors for economic purposes, at least. Not in a dependent sort of way, but we do need our neighbors for the meaning in our lives, the happiness in our lives, and the quality of our lives. When Jesus commands us, you know, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, this isn't a suggestion he makes that's based on whether or not they can help with our economic viability. That's why you're supposed to love your neighbor. Or they have a utilitarian purpose. They can help us out. No, his commandment is grounded in the understanding that the meaning and the happiness of our lives is directly dependent on our relationships and the quality of those relationships and friendships. If you look closely at the American dream, or what's often called the good life in American culture, there's not very much at all in that dream that has anything to do with relationships. The American dream is about accumulating things. It's about accumulating either a really modest income or a very big income. It's about accumulating or acquiring a home and possessions and warm boots and gloves for cold days. Do we honor or do we celebrate being with people beyond our own family as much as we honor and celebrate the other things of life? You know, our achievements, Uh, some dogged pursuit we have for a particular sport that that just has us? Do we honor and celebrate, you know, our 
the people of our relationships as much as we celebrate and honor our home renovations, our kitchen remodeling, our working overtime, our bettering ourselves in some way. I wonder about this. I do. I honestly wonder if, if we take friendship as kind of an extra, an add-on, an accessory that we don't really need, or at least we take it for granted. I like to think friendship is hard work. One of my phrases is, we fall in love, but we make friends, which are two very different verbs. And so to make friends takes labor, it takes effort, it's hard. Here at St. Paul Lutheran Church, we have milestones for every single grade up through grade 12, except for the fifth grade. We still need to find one. And the one I think we should have is a milestone about friendship. It's just perfect, it seems to me, for fifth graders. Just because kids can play together, it doesn't mean they understand the hard work that's involved with friendship. How to make the right kind of friends. How to be a good friend to someone else. And how to acquire all of those social skills that allow us to sustain friendships. This is hard work. I think we should be investing in it. Well, what if relationships outside of our immediate family, what if these are at the heart of a good life? A really and truly. Not the things we own, or the things we accomplish, or the things we possess, or the things we achieve. But what if the relationships and the friendships beyond our immediate, immediate family, what if those are at the heart of a good life? Personally, I try to keep my tabs on the happiness movement, as it sometimes is called in, in the United States. Uh, and you're all familiar with it. It's just the series of books and workshops and programs that you can sign on to and read enthusiastically about how to lead a happy life. And if you go to Barnes & Noble and you see a third of the shelves have to do with books about happiness, you know full well that as far as most of them are concerned, the good life is all about the self. Finding a great job, raising great kids, making great money, and there's some other things thrown in there, like make sure you keep an empty shelf somewhere in your house, and don't forget to pet your dog, and be kind to yourself, not overly critical. Don't be a perfectionist, that's going to work, at your, chip away at your happiness. They're basically about generally feeling great about yourself. You may have known or noticed that uh, in recent years, at Yale University, they have the most popular course running now that they have in their entire 320-year history. It's a, it's a course on happiness. It's taught by Lori Santos. She's a big name now, and the title of the course is The Science of Well-Being. More than 8 million people have taken this class, so obviously most of them online, but she packs the auditorium there at Yale. The opening sentence of the course catalog you will engage in a series of challenges designed to increase your own happiness. It's not organized around the quality of your relationships or your friendships. It all has to do with you. I actually think that we could plot the evolution of American culture in the last century from when we were a more communal society to one where there's a lot of personal loneliness right now. I think we could plot that by watching the evolution of magazines. In the 1940s and 50s, the biggest magazine in America was a picture magazine called Life, as in all of life. A couple decades later, the first publication of People magazine came out. So it was no longer just all of life, but at least it was about people. A number of years after that came Us magazine. So not all people, just us people. And it wasn't too many years after that that somebody began publishing Self magazine. So not us, but just me, myself, and I. Well, I've been thinking about the quality of our relationships 
and our friendships because of something that happens to these fishermen that I read about just moments ago when uh, Jesus stumbles upon them one day. You heard the story, these two sets of brothers, there's Andrew and Simon. These are the ones that are throwing a net over the side of their boat in the waters of the Sea of Galilee. And the other set of brothers is James and John. And they evidently have some holes that are a little too big so the fish are getting out. So they are mending their nets. And the lines that some of you know and some of you have heard and some of you will never forget are these two. Jesus who says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And then this one, immediately, these men left their fishing nets behind and they followed Jesus. The rest is history. They were officially disciples from there forward. Now, I would wager that the dominant interpretation of these verses that preoccupies most of our imaginations every time we hear them goes something like this. Jesus says, raise your hands and say yes to me. And to raise your hand, by the way, you got to drop your nets. And I need some good people to accompany me and to hunt and capture some other people so we can make them Christian. Your job, now that you've raised your hand, is to capture them and to convince them to live in my name. I think we think of it this way because we hear, I'm going to make you fishers of people. So we get this assertive concept. We get this aggressive mindset. We've got to coerce people into something we think Jesus wants them to become. We have to force them to accept Jesus into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. we got to scare them into compliance. And if they don't comply, well, just drop the name of hell and maybe they'll comply. We need to secure their destiny by some kind of nonstop, you know, evangelism. we got to look for converts. we got to look for people we can convince to follow Jesus. Snag them, if you will, just like you snag fish in a net. Well, this kind of thinking, it doesn't work. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus of Nazareth. When he says, I will make you fish for people, it has nothing to do with going after people and ensnaring them. It is about taking your zeal for whatever you might be good at, in their case, fishing, and to connect all of that passion with the people you meet, and people who might be your neighbors, with whom you have the chance to build relationships. So literally think of it like this. Jesus saying, I will shape you, I will form you, I will fashion you into individuals who fish for people. I will help you discover how to live a compelling life that isn't organized around yourself, but that's organized around your relationships these powerfully important friendships. And I want you to take the same focus and the same dedication that you have for fishing and transfer that to some beautiful ways that you can connect with other people's lives. Jesus wants to form us into people who care about the kinds of things that he cares about. And by the way, if the word disciple scares you because you look at the story and you say, well, they're great great for those guys. They had courage. I'd never have such a thing. And you don't want the word disciple anywhere close to your name. Well, don't worry about that. Just lose the word disciple. But ask yourself, if someone were to come into your house, a total guest, a stranger, someone unacquainted with the Christian faith entirely, and they were to stay with you for three months, on the day that they're packing their suitcase to leave, would they be able to say, that Christian life that I witnessed, that is the best? In other words, they'd be so astounded by your way of life, they would want it for themselves. Would they be able to say that? Would they be able to think that? To be a follower of Jesus Christ is to bet your life on Him. 
is to be formed into a certain kind of person who cares about and who embodies the same things that he cares about and that he embodies. So what marks you as a Christian is not that you pray, but it's also who you're willing to pray with. And what marks you as a Christian is not who you will feed alone, but who you also might eat with. And what marks people like you and me as Christian is not who we will love through the goods and services that we provide, but who we will also enter into some kind of deep and caring relationship with as well. We may not need our neighbors in the same way that the Amish people do when they build a barn. But the Lord is waiting to fashion us into people who, just like those Sea of Galilee fishermen, are willing to make themselves available. Yeah, the gift of making themselves available to others. When Jesus walked those sh the shorelines there of the Sea of Galilee, I'm not sure he was looking for certain kinds of personalities. I don't even believe he was looking for particular talents or spectacular gifts or extraordinary abilities. I think what Jesus was looking for was some people who are available. Available to him and available to other people whom they might meet and with whom they might create a relationship. There is only one kind of person that God never uses, so far as I can tell. And that is a person who is unavailable. I will form you, says Jesus. I will shape you. I will mold you into individuals who fish for people. I will help you discover how to live a compelling life that isn't organized primarily just around yourself, but rather around other people and these rich friendships and these deep relationships that we are capable of forming. It's as if Jesus is saying, this is what I want to do. You have to want to care about what I care about. So the question is, are you available? And if you are then, says Jesus, well, come follow me. Amen.
I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, as we face another week of life, let's cherish our friendships, deepen our relationships, and try to care about the things that Jesus cared about. And then we might together enjoy a really good life. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, and thanks for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to projects that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way you feel a part of that reach. Tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.